Hi, it's time I try something different and make an FFJ video outside of flying season. Here's some FFJ history, present and a few words about the future on top of a collage of my library of photos and videos. Just as the world began recovering from a natural disturbance, another man-made disturbance started brewing in the east. While we were able to do something about the natural disturbance, we can't do much about man's madness. We still somehow managed to get a mostly normal 2023 FFJ season together and let's hope that 2024 is going to also happen normally. But people being people and evolution being evolution, I'm not willing to place any bets on it. So let's talk F5J. What is F5J? It's a soaring sport with radio controlled gliders. It has certain rules that Oli over at Flightcomp explained in detail. See the link in the corner. However, I haven't seen anyone talking much about how it came to be and how it all started. So let's dig into some history. Earliest written record I found about electric model flight is in Model Aeronautics Yearbook by a Slovenian guy Franze Zajec, or Frank Zajic as he's known in the West. He was born in the same part of town as my grandfather, but emigrated to United States after First World War. It's likely that my grandfather knew him as a kid, but I have no way of proving that. In the US, he became an avid airplane model builder and developed a wide social network of connections with fellow model builders around the world. Back then, social network meant address books and written letters. His books are a wonderful collection of these letters with various interesting ideas, plans, observations, experiences, and so on. And among those letters, there's a letter from Fred Militki describing his first attempts at electric propulsion for models and unexpected first success. It's a fascinating read. Hit pause here to read it. Based on designs by Militki, electric model planes became a commercial product in the 70s and from there ideas and possibilities that they offer grew. It's in the nature of people that they want to compare against each other in some form of competition. How do we compete in aviation? Flight speed, distance flown, flight duration, model looks and pilot flying skills like acrobatics. World Air Sports Organization FAI, and its Aero Modeling Commission CIAM have this organized in various categories and are overseeing competitions worldwide. FAI goes back to 1905 and CM was established in 1936 and developed into the largest FAI commission based on the number of categories it handles. It all began with free flight which developed multiple ways to compete in flight duration many of which are still widely popular today. It mostly relies on bubbles of warm air in the atmosphere where the game is to find these invisible volumes of air and use them to extend the time your model stays in the air. A number of F1 and F2 free flight categories exist that play this game, differentiating in details like how to get a model in the air. Some use tow line, others use rubber or internal combustion engines, and nowadays there's even an electric option available. When radio control technology became widely available, an F3 category was established, F3A covered acrobatics and F3B covered combined distance and duration competition. I only have bits and pieces of information how they developed into F3J, which is a duration only competition, and I'd be thankful if you guys can point me to some reading on this part of our history down in the comments. F3J was very popular in the early 90s when I joined my local RC club as a teenager and I spent some years towing planes up at local competitions. Score of a flight in F3J was measured with time from when the model got free of the tow line and until it touched the ground, plus landing precision. So the game was to put as much energy as possible into the model in the shortest possible time, both in form of height and speed. 
tau line here become the physical constraints and the element that equalize the playing field as we set up all the pilots with about the same amount of energy at the start of each flight. This was seen as very fair to all involved and competition really was mostly between pilots' air reading and flying skills. Through the decades that F3J was running, there was very noticeable progress in model design, aerodynamic know-how, materials and construction. I remember F3J models in the 90s weighing over 3 kilograms and frequently collapsing under the stress of tau. For comparison, F3J model these days can be made under 1.5 kg and is much stronger. Composite construction and materials developed so far that they became the differentiating factor between pilots on the field and since lighter models were much more expensive than the heavier ones and some people felt like they're in a disadvantage because of that. Therefore, the rule has been put into place not long ago that limits the lowest mass of the model. Footage you are seeing here is from September 2018 competition in Babenhausen near Frankfurt, Germany, where one of the last FTJ World Cup events was held before this rule came into effect. Ideas about electric FTJ equivalent started appearing around the turn of the millennium. When I first heard of it, it was already being discussed as F5J, F5 being a CM category for models with electric propulsion and J being associated with thermal soaring. Electricity in the air is apparently something so special that it deserves its own CM category. F5 at that time had two popular categories, F5B and F, that are very much like F3B, a distance and duration competition, and F5D, pylon racing, which is a speed competition. Both have their own group of fans, but both were in decline and recently F5D got merged with F3D. And that left F5 very much in need of a new popular category. Initial attempts at F5J in our corner of the world wanted to retain the excitement of fast climb to altitude that tow line gave to F3J models. Power density of nickel metal hydrogen batteries in early 2000 combined with the appearance of very efficient brushless motors made this possible. Those attempts also opted for retaining score based on time from motor switch off to landing. This soon led into conflicts between those who could afford more powerful and therefore more expensive motor and battery versus everybody else. Initially, we attempted to find the balance by specifying maximum mass of battery as that translated well into available power. But when lithium battery chemistry became widely available and was improving almost on a monthly basis, this concept started to fall apart and at least in Slovenia we lost many good pilots who stopped attending local competitions. Still, by that time we already had a well-established tour of competitions going on between Hungary, Slovakia and Slovenia with 50 to 80 people attending regularly. Later Czechia also joined and it was about that time that first discussions about F5J appeared at CM meetings. If I remember correctly, initial proposal came from the US and they described it as a lower power F5F, which is itself a lower power F5B and that was met with resistance from many European delegates. Since there was obvious interest into getting F5J under CM umbrella, a working group was established with the aim to find a middle ground between all interested parties. And it looks like working group did its job very well. Although we initially wanted to retain a requirement of some electrical propulsion know-how, by having a variometer device switching off your motor if a model is climbing too fast and keeping the standard stopwatch timing from the motor switch off to landing, majority opted for a much more simple approach with altimeter and the motor switch off altitude being part of the score, dropping the error prone human factor of when exactly the stopwatch should be started. All that remained from required electric propulsion know-how is it must fit in the narrow fuselage and it must spin a prop. Anything that fits this criteria is good enough. First competitions using this concept were held even before the rules themselves were finalized. In 2011, Ternava in Slovakia hosted a competition that proved these rules to work amazingly well and no major issues came up with organization. 
Tarnava then continued to host a World Challenge, as they called it each year, all the way until 2019, when the first World Championship was held there. Since Siam has a rule to run newly established categories as World Cup for a few years before they promote them to championship status, SIFJ started developing as a number of World Cup competitions initially all over Europe and soon jumped over to some other continents as well. We could have had a first European Championship already in something like 2014 or 15, but at the same time as F5J rules were voted into existence, another rule was voted into effect, a four-year moratorium on any new Class 1 category, meaning no new Championships for the next four years. Apparently, some people were of opinion that there were too many categories already with just small number of competitors worldwide. After that landed in the CM rulebook, we had to propose an exception based on number of competitors so that we could get F5J promoted to category 1 and find suitable years for continental and world championships. For me, personally, all this was an interesting lesson in politics and procedures. While this was developing, we got almost a full decade of World Cup competitions. Many interesting and exciting moments in the air, some of which you can experience here on my channel. Reading invisible air is always exciting, a bit like real-time micro-scale weather forecasting. It turns out that differences between models are much less important than air reading skills, meaning that the pilot who spends the most time out on different fields practicing will likely get better results than the pilot with newest, fanciest model. Differences between models these days are mostly cosmetic, but in my opinion, there are still some 10% of performance hidden that we can extract with a different approach to airplane design, but that's maybe a topic for another time. So what's the current situation? We had our first continental championship as the European Championship in Dubnica, Bulgaria in 2018. Then we had first World Championship in Trnava, Slovakia in 2019. In 2020 we hit a break together with the rest of the world. 2021 saw some competitions on national level since they were required to establish national teams. 2022 got us back on track and we saw second European Championship in Seged, Hungary. 2023 gave us second World Championship again in Dubnica in Bulgaria and I'd like to see some continental championships happen on other continents too. Each of these events also sets aside some time for a kind of roundtable discussion about current issues and ideas and proposals for the future. One hot topic that's floating around for some years now is further automation of flight time measurement allowing us to simplify the competition by dropping the requirement for timekeepers. Idea here is that each model should carry a sensor package that would reliably detect model launch and landing and give us time between both events. This might look simple on paper, but there are plenty of corner cases that would need to be handled, including some rule changes. One such example we have now is that Time should be stopped when model first touches the ground or anything connected to the ground, and that is pretty much impossible to detect from within a model. In case of automation, we should stop time when model comes to a stop, which can be reliably detected. The way I imagine this to work would require a sensor package to include GPS, accelerometer and a microphone. All of these components are mass produced for a mobile phone market and therefore cheap and accessible. In fact, at least two offers already exist on the market that enable this kind of timekeeping and they are being tested by a few pilots. What needs to happen is for these devices to be presented to CM F5 and CM Electronic Devices working groups, preferably together with the limitations and required rule changes so we can form a baseline of discussions and see how they can be integrated either into F5J or into a completely new category. Another thing we should work on is popularizing this sport. Mand gliders now come with real-time telemetry, which enables a commentator to present a live view of what's happening in the air 
and we should look into developing something similar, but on our scale, meaning a range of a few kilometers and packaged in at most a few tens of grams. GPS trackers for models are available already for more than a decade. Now we need live transmission of this data, their collection and visualization in real time. Any volunteers? I imagine for this to work there will also have to be a viable business case attached to it. If you take a look around the wider world, electric aviation is taking off some two decades after electric cars and we need a new generation of engineers with practical experience in this field that will develop a proper next generation 21st century mode of air transportation. Sports like this in F5 are a perfect breeding ground for this sort of knowledge. And keep in mind that the first human-made flying vehicle on another planet is also electric powered and there are amazing opportunities opening up in exploration of other worlds. I see F5J as an introverted individual and intellectual sport. It emphasizes observation of natural energy flows in our immediate environment, identifying useful ones and riding them to achieve our defined goal. Practicing these skills teaches us about importance of living with the nature and not brute forcing our way through it as we are currently doing with fossil fuels based society. Fossil fuels are a form of loan, not of money, but energy, and someday this loan will have to be paid back with interest. That's why we need to learn to be much more efficient with the energy we have available, both as individuals and as civilization. Speaking of efficiency, some time ago I got an offer of sponsorship for this channel by including ads for big SUVs. I didn't even reply to that offer as I don't see SUVs as a sensible transport option. A vehicle we need to travel to our competitions needs to be long enough to accommodate our plane parts, big enough for a person or two to sleep in, comfortable for long distance traveling and cheap to run. So far, this combination of requirements were a kind of unobtainium, but luckily, there's now an option emerging that I'd like to present. It's called Aptera, and it's aiming to be the first sane car since the demise of electrified chariots in the early 20th century. It's like a showpiece of F5J values and meets all of the requirements we have. It's super aerodynamic, which makes it the most efficient by far. It's charged by sun, our models fit easily in the long trunk, and you can set it up as a tent for two to spend a night or two in it over the weekend on the field. The more you research this thing, the more amazing it becomes. It's composite construction, so we know how to fix any scratches or bumps. Company behind it supports right to repair, so you'll be able to do any maintenance yourself. Major parts like composite shell and the motors will be initially made in Europe and so on. Needless to say, I was among the first to put down a reservation for one. I'm closely following their development and I'm eagerly awaiting delivery, likely sometime in the next year or two. I've set up another YouTube channel where I plan to keep track of all the adventures I'll have with it. I expect it to greatly lower my travel costs and allow me to attend even more competitions around Europe ensuring that this channel will have plenty of content in the future as well. If you also happen to be looking for a new 21st century vehicle and find Aptera suitable, please use my referral link below to reserve yours. You will get $30 off your fully refundable reservation and sponsor me in the process. Thank you and see you soon on the field flying.